thank you all for coming. Now for many, many years, I lived in the community and nobody knew that I'd been in the service until Private Ryan came out. That's not his name, but that's what they put to it. It's a good story, it isn't all true. He was in the 501 General Kennard's unit, but he got dropped in the wrong place and came to our unit and stayed. And so when the reporters started coming, and that's when this thing came out, and everybody said, well, why didn't you talk about it? Did it, you know, hurt you to talk? I said, no. I said, well, everybody that came back and that I knew, especially around where I live, we all built our own houses. We all got married. We were too busy to talk about it. All we wanted to talk about is what we were doing. Until later, this gentleman called me and said he had been interviewing veterans and using them in his classes. And would I sit for a, an interview? There are a few things to say. One, I am, did nothing special. Our unit did something special. And I was privileged to have been a part of that unit all the way through, from the start until the finish. I'm a symbol of those who can't be here today. Secondly, none of us consider ourselves as heroes because we volunteered for this, we trained for this, and we got paid for it. And I consider policemen, firemen, EMT, in the same category. We're all the same. Bravery beyond compare. I can't imagine going into a burning building the way firemen do. I'm not sure I would have the courage to do that. A policeman, three o'clock in the morning, stops a car with a bunch of grungy people and he's taking his life in his hands. I don't think I could do that. I did what I was trained to do. It went against all the things we were raised with. We got medals for killing people. Back here, they put you in jail for that. So that's, that's a big change. Now, people have asked me, how did it feel seeing people die? Well, I wrote my mother a letter, and I still have the letter. And I told her it didn't seem to bother me in the least, and it didn't. After seeing a couple of people killed, it doesn't bother you. Well, how about seeing your buddies? I said, you know what? Unless you're especially close to somebody, it doesn't bother you. And if you can't accept it and do that way, you don't belong in that kind of a unit. Now, I grew up listening to tales of veterans in World War I. And some of them, my neighbors had been gassed, and I heard them at night trying to breathe. We lost more people over there at the disease in the trenches than they did by fighting. This country became extremely isolationist, and I was one of the worst. We were never going to go over there and pull the chestnuts out of the fire again. We had an ocean on each side to heck with them. I was in the defense industry. There were about 300 and some people in the manufacturing side, and I was in the tool and die side. We had about 150. I had a deferment. I wasn't going to go. Pearl Harbor didn't change me in the least, and the people around me felt the same as I did. The manufacturers were not interested in doing war work. We were coming out of the Depression. Things were picking up. And they were doing about 10% war work, and they were very happy. The government actually had to threaten with some of these industrialists with jail to make them get on board. Now, we should have gone into this a long time before we did, but we would have been a mistake because we didn't have anything. We, like all countries after World War I was over, 
we went down to practically nothing. But after a while, we listened to Father Coughlin talking about burning up the draft boards, and Hitler ran it in a raven. We'd go down to the theater on weekends, that's where we got our news. But what really started to change me was they came out with a regulation that they were drafting men up to age 35 with three children. And here I am, a young man with no family to worry about. How would I feel the rest of my life? So I determined I was going to go. Ed Johnson, who owned the company, Johnson Tool and Engineering, he blew a fuse, had me called up in the penthouse to talk about it. And I said, well, Ed, I'm just an apprentice. It really doesn't matter. And he said, Jim, these contracts we have are all cost plus, and for every hour you're here, I get $5 clear. And I was making 60 cents an hour. He said, I don't give a damn if you sleep in the rag bin. That was actually the way people felt. Well, anyway, there were two things I was interested in. When I was five years old, a classmate of my mother's who lived in Bedford, Indiana, invited the family over to see them. And the county fair was on, and I saw a parachute jump. And I thought, someday I'd like to do that. But I was more interested in submarines. I'd read about Professor Beebe going down the Mariana Trench, 40,000 feet in the Bass Escape. Read about Jules Burns, 20,000 leagues under the sea and everything. Monson who made the escape capital for disabled subs. So I signed up. And then I said to the guy, how soon am I going? He said, well, they're working on a sub you'll be on, um, be about six months. You go home and we'll call you. Well, that didn't sit very well. I couldn't go back and ask Ed to let me back for six months after that. So I went across the hall and signed up for parachute troops. I'd already signed up for the Navy, but that didn't bother me. I didn't even think about it. Well, I went to Fort Harrison, Indiana. They got a group of us together, five or six of us, and sent us to a place called Tocoa, Georgia. And we got on the train, and the conductor looked at that and said, Tokyo, you guys are going the wrong way. He never heard of the place. I hadn't either. General Bradley was very much interested in what happened at Crete. The Germans took that island, but they paid a terrible price. And Hitler was never interested in paratroopers after that. But he thought that with some changes, maybe it could fit in with the Army. Well, the old Army was not thrilled. They were not interested in having this, and they tried to stop it. But Bradley got to, to Roosevelt. Now, Roosevelt was Navy, and he listened, but he wasn't too thrilled about it either. But he, he gave him the go-ahead. He said, I want a unit that's never been fielded one that's better than anything that anybody's ever had. And he picked a guy named Colonel Robert Sink, class of 27, West Point, to run it. And he told him, you can have any personnel you want, you can have any material you want, anything you want done, the only person who can countermand it is Roosevelt. They didn't want old army men in to intimidate or bother what was going on. They wanted new people. 6,500 people signed up. We went up to this place that had been a World War I camp, later a 3C camp, up in the mountains. And they really put us through the ringer. From July 15th to the 1st of December, we did what Colonel Sink thought up and called Airborne Basic. Prior to that, if you're going to be a paratrooper, you went to Fort Benning for four weeks and you came out a paratrooper. You'd send six or eight guys to one regiment and a dozen to another. But he had another feeling. He wanted unit cohesion. And when you did it the way they were doing, you didn't have that. And besides that, they were losing 25% of these people 
in the third stage over there. They had a lot of money in them, and that was not going very well. So we did that attrition before we got there. But in that time, from July to December 1st, we went from 6,500 to 1,650. Then we went to Camp McCall for further training, then to Fort Bragg for further training, then to Camp Shanks, where we got on a ship called the Samaria. That was a British cruise ship. Now that's my company going up the mountain. That mountain, that, that was a three mile one way trip, six, six miles round trip. And we're expected to do that in company formation in 45 to 50 minutes. We did that four and five times a week for those three or four months we were there. And that took a lot of guys out, probably a lot of good guys that would have been combat guys because we got into combat, we didn't run that much. We could have done without it, but it did, it did toughen you up. And in 105 degree heat in the summer, we ran it. And when it was sleet and rain toward the fall, we still ran it. And sometimes we ran carrying our weapons. And that was really something. That's our luggage there, lined up ready to go on a 136 mile march. The Japanese held the world record for Force March, 118 miles. The first battalion of our regiment went all the way on a train to Fort Benning. The commander of the second battalion said to Colonel Sink, I would like my men to beat the Japanese. So they went from Atlanta, from Tokoa to Atlanta, 100. I think it was 120 miles or so. They held the record for about two weeks. And then we went. We took the train down to Atlanta and then went from Atlanta to Fort Benning, 136 miles. We still hold the world record. It will never be beaten because the Army says they will never let that happen again. It was too hard on the people. It sleeted and rained 28 degrees mud up your ankles. The field kitchens couldn't stay lighted because of the wind and the rain. So they fed us peanut butter and cheese sandwiches the whole time we were out there. That's on the march right there. Now that it's a mock-up of the fuselage and we all had to go up and jump out of that and there was a pulley on a cable and then you slid down the cable to the end of it. One time there were some new guys came in on a weekend and they, some of the guys took them down to the parade field and said, one of the things you have to do is jump out of that thing up there. They didn't tell them you had to get a hold of pulley, and they jumped out of it 40 feet up. Well, Colonel Sink had something to say about that. And that didn't happen again. That's the 250-foot jump towers. You would lay flat on the ground, they put you in a harness, and then pull you up there, and then you say, the instructor say, one, two, three, pull. And you pull your rip cord and drop 20 feet. <coughs> well, that worked all right until cable broke one time. They stopped that. Now, the, the planes they had were C-47s that should have been in a junkyard 10 years before. They had oil spewing down the sides of the planes. The engine sounds like they were coming out of the fuselage, but we didn't care. We had to, our first five shoots, we had to pack ourselves. And, you know, you stop to think about that. You've never even seen a parachute before, and you go in there and that guy tells you how to do it. 
And then you, you put that thing on, you think, you know, is this thing going to work or not? But they did. Uh, there were some accidents. Uh, there were some British guys that came in. They made their three jumps. And then they decided they didn't want to jump anymore. So one of our guys named Lance Edgman, he was paid $25 to make the two jumps for them. Now, he had made three jumps himself. And then he decided he didn't want to be a paratrooper, so he refused to jump, and they threw him out. So I don't know whatever happened to him. But we went through some pretty tough times down there. Uh, Colonel Singh got us out on the hillside one time, and he said, I understand you guys are not happy. No. You don't like the food. No. You think I'm too hard on you? Yes. Now, he talked very little, and he never raised his voice. But he just sat there and said, well, I'm going to tell you something. It's going to get a hell of a lot worse before it gets any better. And then several weeks later, he called us out there again, and he said, I want to tell you, fellas, I had a congressman come to see me. One of you people sent a note to his mother how terrible I was treating you. And I'm going to tell you the next congressman that comes to me, the guy that made that happen is going to wish he wasn't born. Well, that's the way it went. Anyway, we're all hopped up. We finally get our wings. My gosh, we were walking on air. Because we're really something now. And really, we had done something. That was something that had never been done before. Anyway, we got on, that's Camp McCall there. Uh, that's when we did a lot of experimental. Our, our regiment was the experimental regiment. Everything new, weapons, the equipment was tried on us. As a result of that, we had quite a few injuries. And some things we kept, some things we got rid of. One time, the group of, of Gloucester uh, wanted to see a parachute jump, and our company was chosen for that. And it was raining, pouring down rain. We flew around for about two hours. We had our machine guns, our mortars, everything. 35 mile an hour wind. Finally, the pilot said, we're going to land. No, no, we're not going to land. Not with this load. This is not, you can't go with a load like this. And there's no landing aids at the field, none. And you can't see a half a mile ahead of you. So we jumped. Sergeant Sarver went out with his rifle across his reserve. And he must have tumbled because it wrapped up in his suspension lines and he got killed. He fell flat in a plowed field and it actually pushed down about four or five inches deep. Lieutenant Doughty went over and was the first guy to be there. He was pretty upset. And then to make it worse, we had to walk 15 miles home in the rain. So that's the introduction to that sort of thing. Yeah, that's the Samaria. It was made for a thousand people in peacetime. We had five thousand people on board. You can imagine what it was like. There was not enough room to put everybody inside, so half the guys were on deck, sleeping on deck, and half were in hammocks down in the bottom. They had two feeding lines, and the first day I was on KP, and we went down in the hold, and there were some big wooden barrels with the heads knocked out, full of brine. And this Indian, and I mean from India, he, he had a, a brawny sort of a guy with hair all up and down his arms. He was a chief cook. He reached down in and pulled a big piece of meat out with horse meat. He said, this is what you're going to eat. And one of the guys said, well, it's got maggots on it. He said, well, it's live meat, ain't it, Mike? Well, that's what they ate. And I didn't eat for the 10 days of the crossing. And the worst part was they had two dish pans, and everybody washed their mess kit in those pans. And every so often they put some more Clorox in it. As a result, everybody got the run. So you can imagine what that's like. Well, 
we got into Liverpool. They put us on a train. It was about three or four o'clock in the morning. We got off at a little place, dark, couldn't see anything at all. The guys had been there to get the camp ahead, the sergeant. Somebody asked him where we were, and he said, it's Hungerford and strictly from hunger. Well, we found out what he meant. That was England on ration time. People in this country thought they had a hard time rationing. They didn't know what rationing was. These people got three or four ounces of meat once a month if you happen to have the meat in. That's actually the way it was. It was just terrible. Now the little, they put us in, split us up in several little towns and my battalion, 750 men, was put in Ramsbury. Ramsbury was a town of 1,500 people with nine pubs. Up on top of the hill was the Air Force with 2,000 people. You can imagine what that was like. And we had a little book how we're supposed to act. Don't brag about what you got at home. These people don't have anything. Treat them with respect. Well, there were some clashes and differences and things the first few weeks, but we all got in into the most wonderful time of our lives. For the time we were there, we all got to know people. I had four houses and an apartment of peace I could walk into without knocking. I had one house where I had a room. I had clothes. If I came in late on a Sunday night, I could just go in and go to bed instead of going into the barracks. It was that. I mean, it was just, and our, all these people interacted with our parents. Letters were going back and forth, and the folks at home were sending things over to the people here who didn't have it. And it was just wonderful. We had quite a few dry runs. We'd get up, clear out to the plane, starting to get in the plane, be called off because Patton or somebody else had overrun the thing. And finally the time came. We went to the marshalling area, about 10 days, and we're all hopped up and everybody's gonna kill every German there is. Sharpening knives, sharpening bayonets, getting in fights, and uh, then we had this weather crisis. We we're supposed to go on the 4th. It was delayed to the start at 11.30 p.m. on the 5th. The weather wasn't too good over in France, but it was good enough for us to go. We got in the planes and looked down, and I saw all those ships down there, 5,000 ships. And I knew they were depending on us. We got over the channel, and the planes were flying in a series of nine planes. And only the lead plane had a navigator. We ran into a heavy cloud bank. Well, the first thing these guys thought of was to scatter out because we were flying almost propeller to tail. In fact, one plane did chop off part of another plane's tail. Well, then we are lost. And on the ground, they had pathfinders, and a pathfinder had what was called a Eureka. It was a transmitter, and then the plane was a receiver called Rebecca, and the pathfinders jumped an hour ahead, and if it was clear, they'd signal to the whatever Syria was supposed to come in there. Well, what happened when they scattered around? They lost that, and the pathfinders had no security. I, 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 I was, it was an awful thing. They were supposed to put the lights out and do the signaling, and yet they had nobody around to protect them. And Captain Lilliman did put out an order, we will keep no prisoners, shoot all prisoners. We can't fool with prisoners. And that was right because they had, they had a job to do. Well, as a result of that, the Air Force thought that they had for the amount of time they flew, they thought they were in the right place, but they weren't. They scattered us all over that peninsula. Some guys dropped 30 miles away. I happened to drop on drop zone D, which was where I was supposed to be. The only problem was there was a contingent of SS troops, Hitler's SS troops, and a contingent of uh, 
tankers, and we dropped right on top of them. In history books, that's called the slaughterhouse because that's what it was. All of our people in my battalion didn't jump. There was 535 out of the 750 that jumped. The rest came in across the sea a couple of days later. But in 33 days of fighting, at 535, we lost 75 captured and 93 killed. Now, the sea forces, they had it even worse than we did. They'd been cooped up on those ships for a week. The seas were high, big storms came in, waves were at six to eight feet high. They were seasick. They were dropped too far out in deep water. They dropped them over, over their heads, many of them. The floating tanks they had were supposed to be 37 of them. 26 of them got swamped and they didn't get them in. Well, anyway, General Taylor had told us going in, give us three days of hard fighting, we'll pull you out. Because we're shock troops. We're not supposed to be in there after that. Wherever there's a hard spot to go, we're going to and break it up and stabilize it and go someplace else but they had nobody else to put in. Now the German high commands, all of them, Hitler on down, said we're gonna let these guys get in on the land, surround them and annihilate them. Rommel said no. If you let them on the land, you lost the war. It turned out he was right. The, the main objective for my unit, my battalion, was two bridges that the Germans had built a few months before we came across the Duve River. One of them was a pedestrian bridge and one a vehicle bridge, and that was to funnel reinforcements down to the beach forces. It was imperative that we keep that from happening. Well, what happened, we did get a patrol across there. There was a plan that my lieutenant came up with we had two rubber boats. We were supposed to put a couple of squads in those boats, tie them together, and I was to swim underwater and take them across. They didn't want to use paddles because they thought that would alert the enemy. Well, as usually happens, when you go to combat, the plan's the first thing that something happens to. Saul Rosenfield, and Warren Nelson were supposed to bring the boats. Saul Rosenfield got captured, and Warren Nelson, when the guys went by, was sitting on the bundle, and somebody said, aren't you coming? He said, no, I'm waiting for Saul to come down and help me. Well, the next thing they found, Nelson dead, and the boats didn't get there, so that changed everything. We did get a patrol across, but it was so bad they had to bring them back they couldn't come back on top of the bridge, so they came back hanging from the superstructure. One guy had been shot, and they took a piece of a barn door and put him on it and shoved him underneath on the superstructure and did bring him back. But we did finally, after three days, we had lost all of our communications equipment and, and division thought that we had been annihilated, so they ordered the bridges destroyed. Well, we heard the fighter bombers coming and we figured out what was going on. And Chaplain McGee and Sergeant, uh, uh, I can't remember his name now. Anyway, they were up on the, Sergeant was letting smoke go. Uh, Chaplain McGee had cerise panels that he was waving. They didn't pay attention to that. They came down across there with guns blazing, dropped the bombs, and we're sitting down there. They straddled the two of them up there and never hit them. But they did hit the bridges, knocked them out. Now those bridges really angered the French people because that, that city down there, Carentan, their livelihood was other countries, and they had to have the canals to get out to the sea. So they were very glad to see that happen. After that happened, of course, then we went wherever we were needed. 
And then the next big thing was Bloody Gully, and that was one of the bloodiest places you ever saw. We came out of that, bivouacked out in the middle of a field, about four or five in the morning. They came in and told us there's a counterattack coming to take, retake Carantan. You guys are going. We walked several miles into Carantan. Bombs were dropping. The Germans were in there, German paratroopers, sixth unit. We're in there. We took the city back. That was the linchpin for that campaign. If we had lost that city, we'd, we'd have lost France. It had been really rough. So when Normandy was over, now I want to tell you about Normandy. Normandy was not like other fighting. It was the most barbaric fighting that we'd ever been into or ever expected to be into and never had anything like it. And the reason was all of those six parachute Germans were told that we're going to kill all prisoners, and we'd been told the same thing about them. The Germans reinforced that by having a non-com at the back of each unit that if he saw a soldier that he didn't think was doing as much as he should, he was to shoot him. So they had a great incentive to do that. We had guys in every unit who liked to shoot prisoners. They got a thrill out of it. Now, when this starts, and some of it was really barbaric, it goes around the battlefield quickly, and then, of course, everybody's doing it. Some of the commanders joined in with the guys. They were as bad as anybody else. Some, like Winters, would not tolerate it. My commander wouldn't either. That doesn't mean it didn't happen in my company, but he didn't know a lot about a lot of it. To give you an idea, two guys in our unit got a couple of German prisoners, and they didn't know what to do with them. So they tied them standing up to a tree and then wound it around with barbed wire and then dropped a grenade there and walked away. And one of the other guys said, my God, what do you think is going to happen to any of us now to get caught? So they unwrapped it and let them lay. And there was an aid station getting ready to take people back to England to the hospital. And there were three Germans. They were unconscious. And several people in our unit castrated them. Some of the guys went into a barn and found four paratroopers stripped naked, hanging from a beam. Not a war wound on them. They'd been slipped from the groin up to the sternum. Their intestines lying in the ground in front of them. Their genitals stuck in their mouth. That's the kind of thing that went on. That didn't happen at any other time that I was in the war, but it was really pretty terrible. Now, when I wrote to my mother and said it didn't seem to bother me, it really didn't. It didn't touch me in the least. You just get used to that sort of thing. So we went back to France, back where we were, or in England, I'm sorry, went back to England. We did more training. We had more dry runs. And finally, uh, we were going to go to Market Garden in Holland. And they said, no more night jumps. They found out what that did to you. It scattered you. You couldn't see. And it was a mess. We did a parade ground jump in Holland. We jumped at about 800 feet, contrasted to 450 in Normandy. On a Sunday afternoon, bright sunny day, we did run in a snowfully heavy flak, but we got through that all right. We hit the ground and every person in Holland wanted to help us. They picked up guns on the battlefield and went with us. Young kids, 15, 16, picked up a rifle and went along. One of them was an in interpreter for our unit. And he was with us for quite a while and he got killed. There were some girls, 15, 16-year-old girls, that on their own initiative took bicycles and rode them to 
German checkpoints and talked their way through and said they had cattle over there to take care of or were going to visit a relative. They came back and told us where all the Germans were and where all the guns and things were. And quite a few of those girls got shot. One young girl, about four or five years ago, well, she lost a leg and about four or five years ago, she was in her 80s and somebody asked her if she thought what she did for us was worth losing her leg and she said yes and I'd do it again. They still feel that way over there. And incidentally, uh, Doug and I have been uh, not only invited but I think commanded to go and so in September, in November, two weeks, we're going back to Holland for 10 days. And I mean, you can't believe when you go back there, there's people who are getting up in age, come up and say, I was five years, six years old when you came, and they hug you and cry and said, you gave us back our freedom. I mean, that's pretty humbling. We had about 70 days, our unit did it in Holland. It was miserable. It was a, Montgomery thought this up. We were to jump on Eindhoven, and then there was a road about 60 miles long, went from there up to the Rhine River. The British were gonna put all, most of their airborne people across the river. There was gonna be a battalion of Polish jump with them, 10,000 in all. We did the first 30 miles. 82nd Airborne did the rest up to the Rhine River. We were to keep a corridor open a mile and a half wide on each side of the road. And this is all through enemy territory. Now the Germans, when we had convoys going, taking people and supplies up, bringing dead and injured back on one little road, tanks 10 foot wide trying to go up the same road. Germans would hit, hit us at two or three spots. Convoys would stop. Everybody gets off the convoy while we're fighting the Germans. They start cooking or going to the toilet or talking to each other. Time you get this straightened up, and get the convoy moved again, you've lost three or four hours. You know, it's pretty bad. Well, there's one bridge across the Mall Wall River that had to be taken. The British sent a commando unit over. But instead of dropping them on the bridge, as they should have done, they dropped them six miles away. The Germans immediately saw what was up in there and reinforced it, and that bridge could not be taken. So we knew at that point this was a failure. If it had been worked correctly and take it, gotten that bridge taken, they were going to go up and turn right and go down in the Saar, the heart of German industrial, and it would have been over by Christmas. But when they couldn't take that bridge, it was over. In the meantime, Montgomery didn't send his troops up fast enough. They were to be relieved over there the second day, and that didn't happen. And then the worst part, we didn't have the tactical air support. There were very little aircraft. They had unlimited amount of guns on the high ground across the river firing at us. The Germans had started their armor down toward the Saar and they came back and we're sitting ducks. And where in the heck is this tactical air? It wasn't there. We still argue about that today. The worst part was in order to get this operation going, they had to take all the supplies, fuel and everything away from Patton and stop him. And he'd been going 20, 25 miles a day and there he sat and he wasn't very happy. This was a political decision that Eisenhower had to do. He didn't want to, but Montgomery had dogged him for weeks about it and finally he was given the okay to do it. That's how these things happened. We're still arguing about it today. We went back to Marmelon, France, 
turned in all of our crew served weapons and all of our extra clothing. The rumor is we're going to go to the States and get a furlough and go to, then go to Guam and get ready to jump on Japan. Instead, Sergeant came in through the barracks at 4 o'clock in the morning to get up, get up, there's been a breakthrough, you're going. And I swore a little bit and said, no, that's another one of the Army's things. We don't have any winter clothing. We don't have any ammunition or weapons have been turned in. But it wasn't long. Big semi-trucks with open sides came. They put us in standing up so tight you couldn't sit down. We started out in the dark. We didn't know when the heck we're going. Drizzly rain, truck sliding off the road. It was a mess. Lights on. You're going through enemy territory with lights on. You know something's going on. This was the last gasp of Germany. They had decided to make a big push through the Ardennes. And they wanted to get to Antwerp where all of our supplies were coming in. Had they been able to do that, the course of the war would have been entirely different. Well, we got off, dumped us off in a muddy field, and there's people coming back crying, coming toward us. They looked like they'd been through a meat grinder. They asked us where we're going, they said, we're going up to fight. They said, no, no, they'll kill all of you, they're killing everybody. What had happened was, that was a quiet sector up there. Nobody expected them to come through there. They had done it once before, but they didn't expect them to do it again. And the 106th Regiment and the 28th were up there. The 106th had never been in combat, but just put them up along the river. And the 28th had been beaten up so bad they were no longer a viable outfit. Just to let the 28th get a little rest and the 106th to get an idea of what it was like to live in a combat area. And they got hit. They were reporting back to intelligence that they were hearing movements of trucks and tanks, lots of them across the river. Intelligence said, no, you guys are on a quiet spot. There's nobody over there. You're jumpy. Uh, they're probably playing records, which they did at times. Now, I have said, and I still believe, that every officer in both of those units was derelict in his duty. Intelligence is also derelict. And the reason I say this, they never put a patrol across there to really see what was there. If they'd have put one patrol over there and seen that Yes, this was a movement of tanks and trucks. Despite the weather, they could have come over and saturation bombing it and broken, broken it up. Intelligence was wrong. They should have been all, I think, court martial. They should have told them to go over and take a look, but they didn't do that either. Now, the Army media woman that interviewed me about this, and I told her how I felt she didn't want to talk about it. I've talked to high-ranking officers. They don't want to talk about it either. But that's my opinion, and I still feel that had they sent somebody over there, we would not have had the Battle of the Bulge. We lost 80,000 people killed, wounded, and missing in that action. Now, there's another thing. 101st Airborne gets all the glory for that. And yes, we deserve it. They put us in a roughly 20 mile circumference irregular line around this town of Bastogne. And the reason they did that, there were seven roads and three railroads going through there and the Germans in order to get the ant rope absolutely had to have that. And we were told to stay there forever. Well, in getting there and getting around there, there's units from quite a few other regiments and divisions, tanks, infantry, special forces, all of that in there with us. And they were put under the command of 101st Airborne, and they fought just as well as we did. 
and yet they got no glory whatsoever. Now, when the siege was broken, when Patton came in, it was put in all the papers we found later that they came and rescued us. And that was not true at all. We did not need to be rescued. As long as planes could fly and drop supplies, we could have stayed. It would have been miserable because it would have been hard to get enough supplies to be where we should be. What Patton did, he was actively engaged in combat. He disengaged the whole army and turned it 90 degrees and came over, I read it just yesterday, about 200 miles and broke the siege. What that did was allow him to take out dead and injured and bring in supplies, which made it a lot easier. But we really didn't need to be rescued. Our mission was to stay there to the last man. That's exactly what they told us. People have asked how it was. Well, I'll tell you how it was. The first 10 days, planes couldn't fly because of the weather. So there was no, no supply. Whatever you had when you went in was what you had. I had three K rations for 10 days. That's one day's meals. Some guys had nothing. At one point, the Germans were butchering pigs at a little village called Recon, about 200 yards from us, and we could see them doing this, and one little pig, about 35 pounds, got away, came almost to us and turned around and started back. Sergeant Debolt ran out and grabbed it, shot it, and laid it down in the snow and cut it up, and the guys ate it raw. Except me, I didn't eat it for two reasons. I don't eat raw meat. And the other is, at that point, I think every pig in the world could have had trichinosis, and I wasn't going to get into that. Nobody got sick, but that's the way things went. There was a decision by division to send an H Company patrol out through our port to go down toward Foy and see what they could find out about the German dispositions around Foy. This lieutenant sent his scout out, and a machine gun opened up, and he got hit on the breastbone and went down. He sent him back out again, and he got hit again. He sent him out the third time, he didn't get up. And then they decided to send all of the patrol out in groups of two or three. They got out toward Foy quite a ways. And I remember there was deep snow. It's about over knee deep at that point. And one of the medics who was left with us started to take his pack off and I asked him what he was doing. He said, well, I'm a medic. It's my job to go get him. And I said, well, you can't do that. You'll get killed. He said, well, I'm going. And he did. And he went out. This is a mid a firefight. Machines gun going, shells coming down. He got a man on his shoulder and shuffled back, went down several times, and he got him back. And that's the way people did things. And remember, this was the worst winter in 50 years, and it went down as low as 20 below zero. Now we had, you know, you shiver when you get cold. Your body's trying to keep warm. We had so little food that we quit shivering. You're in the first stage of hypothermia, but there's nothing you can do about it. We went in with nothing but a raincoat and our jumpsuit. Now, after the planes came in, after they got fuel and ammunition in, then they came in and dropped overcoats and galoshes. But by that time, everybody had frozen feet and frozen hands. And there's nothing you can do about it. Now, if you went in, got hit, and went into aid station, and your feet are black, they cut them off. One guy had gangrene grew up to his knees, and they told him they're going to have to cut them off. And he said, no. They said, well, you're going to die. He said, then I'm going to die. I'm not going home without my legs. And he ran up and down the makeshift hospital, and believe it or not, he still got his legs when he went home. And they said they'd never seen anything like that. Now, they captured our medical detachment. 
Now we had some small first aid stuff, but not, they ran out of anesthetic the first thing after that aid station got taken. They were doing amputations and, and other operations with no anesthetic. Just four guys hold a guy down and do it. Now people say, you know, how can you do it? Well, you do what you have to do, and that's all there is to it. And one of the guys I talked to later had that happen. He said that was the most painful thing that ever happened to me, and he said, fortunately, I passed out. Well, that's Birch's Garden. Yeah, that's the last city we took. Yeah. And the last thing we took was the Hitler's hideout on top of the hill. Now, we felt that since we'd gone all through the war, that all of us should get a chance to go up and look at that thing. But that's the one thing I will never forgive Winters for. He only let E Company go up there. I never got up there until he and I went up a couple years ago. We got to see it. Now that's not too high. It looks like it, but it's about 6,500 foot elevation. But I'll tell you what, what scared me the most was taking the bus ride up there. There's no guardrails any place, and it's a corkscrew road, and that guy was going around there. Man, I'm telling you, I thought I was back in a war zone. Now the elevator that they talk about, I always thought, you know, an elevator, 10, 12 guys going, you'd get 50 people in that elevator. And it's 600 feet up in solid rock. They actually excavated solid rock. Now, of course, when we got in there, they shut it down. Nobody could go up. But uh, you had to walk up if you wanted to go up. Some of the most beautiful country in the world. And you just can't imagine that people could in a place like that do what they did. When the war ended, they came up with the ski. Everybody thought you were going to go home when you got it, as soon as the war was over. When you went in the war, whether you were drafted or you were enlisted, you signed up for the duration of six months. But they came up with a system of points. How long you've been overseas, uh, how many decorations you had, and a few other things. And you came up to this magic figure of 85 points, you got to go home early. Well, I was one of those, and most of our unit was. The guys down in Nice stayed in that paradise all through the war. They raised a big stink because they didn't get to go home right away. Well, they sat down there and enjoyed life. But they found out that also, Anybody been in the guardhouse, when a guard, when you're in combat, the guardhouse went. When a combat's over, they go back in the guardhouse. And that doesn't change their time at all. And then they found out, much to their sorrow, that they had to stay over an additional time, make up for good time for each day of bad time they had. So there was quite a bit of howls about all that sort of thing. And it took quite a while to get everybody out. Now, we come to get out of the service. People talk about how people in Vietnam were treated. Yes, they were treated badly. But remember, our industry was going full blast. Anybody who wanted a job at that time could have it. When we came back, and there was no rationing, when we came back, there was rationing. You couldn't buy a car. You couldn't buy lumber to build a house, and we're all trying to do it. And I said, well, how are we going to get lumber? And they said, well, you don't have an allotment. Well, how do you get an allotment? Oh, they gave them out when the war started. Well, where do I go to get one? Well, you we can't get one now. And that's what we were up against. Then all of Industries were winding down, laying people off. 
Now remember, when all the guys went, the women went in factories. And you know what? Despite what all, a lot of the guys said, the women did as good or better job than we did in all these factories. First time in their life, these women had independence. They were making decisions for the house, the kids. They were doing the financing, paying the mortgages. When the guys came back, that caused a lot of problems. They didn't want to give up that independence. They didn't. They shouldn't have. The guys I worked with told me, you guys ruined everything. You came back. We had all the women. We had all the liquor. And now you come back and spoil it. <laughs> well, that's exactly what they told us. And the law said they had to take us back. Now, when it was over, well, you can see what time has done to me. <laughs> but my wife looks like I do, and I still love her the same as she was. And she's 93 now, and we still live her on our own. Well, uh, this Band of Brothers show was really all I can tell you. I know there are a lot of mistakes in it, a lot of things that are not small things that are not right. And some of them I thought were big things. And I said, another thing, you had a sex scene, raw. I said, you shouldn't have put that in. And I said, I don't think it happened. Who in the hell in the middle of combat is going to be having sex with a girl? And what, what Holland girl from Holland is going to be smiling with a guy on top of her in the middle of combat? Well, I, I've seen it several times. And I think they must have taken it out because it wasn't there. And then when he got pretty upset with me, he said, well, we did that for dramatic effect. I said, but that's wrong. That's not dramatic effect. That's stupid. <laughs> um, anyway, the Band of Brothers guys, a guy named Dale Dye, he's the black ops guy. He's been in more combat than most people ever thought of being. He, he's been in those places, still is going, where if something goes wrong, your country, country doesn't know you. He's tough. Well, they hired him to run this thing for these guys to get them ready for this film, to be the actors. Some of them hate him to this day because he was so hard on them, but he made them, and he made them famous. And I have told these guys, we've met almost all of them several times, and I love all of them. I think they're wonderful. I said, you know, when I sit here and look at that, you guys look at good with a couple of weeks training as we did at six months. And it's true. They do. Now, there are things that are wrong. For instance, I can understand why the filming they have to do, they're bunched up. You never bunch up in combat. One shell can kill a whole bunch of guys. When you're walking in a column, spread out, spread out. I can see why you do that. I'm very happy to have done it, and I will tell you this. People come up and say, thank me for my sacrifice. I do not consider anything we did as a sacrifice, and neither do any of the people that I was with. Can you imagine, at the time when we went in there, most people in, well, out in the Midwest, many people had never seen a plane. I didn't know anybody had been up in the plane. We read about all those World War I battles, all those big cathedrals, all those wonderful cities, and we got to go over and see all of that in a way that tourists can never see it even today because we got to talk to the people who lived through it. And to me, that was priceless. So I had... To be able to come and talk to people and tell them a little bit of what it's like, uh, I consider that just absolutely fabulous. See, we had a mandatory insurance policy we had to take through the government, 650 a month. They just deducted it from your pay. 
$10,000. And I used to tell the guys, and I used to send a letter to my mother and dad, and I said, if I get killed, I want you to buy a farm. Now, when we'd go into a firefight and come out of it, somebody would say, well, what happened to so-and-so? Oh, he bought the farm. That's where that started. Okay. Okay. okay, any other questions? Yes, did you ever take advantage of the GI Bill? Well, I know a lot of people have asked me that. Yes, I did. I went out to UD and I took the exams and they told my wife I did some of the highest they'd ever had. I went in and they had a teacher. She had a, a comprehensive writing thing we were supposed to do and I did it. And she got up in front of the class and said, I want to read this and it was mine. And she said, that's the best one that's been turned in here for a long time. But I'm going to tell you, it's not good enough. And I thought, what the hell with you, lady? <laughs> My IQ was up where I was offered to go into West Point. I wasn't interested in that either. I'd have missed the war. If you signed up, three of us from my company were offered that. But you had to sign up for seven years and you missed the war. So we didn't sign up.